go. I used to be somebody, but now. Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, I don't know if you guys have plans uh, for tonight, but I've got a gathering, so I'm going to talk little and listen a lot. And uh, we'll go through introductions real quick. I'm John Bly. I'm uh, with the Engineering Contractors Association and been on this committee for, I don't know, a lot of years. Kurt? Uh, Kurt Nichols. Um, this will actually, um, things go the way I think, be my last meeting here. I've been <laughs> on this group for, uh, I don't know, 20 years, plus or minus, I don't know, somewhere in there, a while. Uh, Mark Hale, that's also on here, I believe, will be taking my spot as the BIA representative. So well, it's I know it's fun inevitable to watch Kurt. everything unfold over all these years. Uh, amazing done job done by um, SCTA staff over over all those years, and it's been uh, exciting to uh, watch it all unfold. Well, I hope you'll find a little spare time to jump in once in a while if something interests you, Kurt. It's you been betcha. a pleasure working with you all these years. Uh, Tom, I'll just go right down there. Tom Conlon. Everybody, Tom Conlon here, Sonoma Valley. I represent the Sonoma County Community, Sonoma County Conservation Coalition on this committee. Uh, been on about six, seven years. Thank you, welcome. Jake. Um, yeah, Jake McKenzie representing uh, Sonoma County uh, Transportation and Land Use Coalition for the last two months. So I'm a short timer. <laughs> I like James Cameron's hat, by the way. Very, <laughs> Not a bad hat, is it? Very cool. All right, we'll go to uh, Drew. Introduce yourself, please. Ooh. I'm Drew Nichols, Clerk of the Board for SCTA and RCPA. Thank you. And Tom Banning? Hi, Tom Banning, uh, Third District. Been on the board about four years, I think. Appreciate you, my friend. And James Cameron, Cowboy James. James Cameron with the Sonoma County Transportation Authority. Gidea and Ross. Uh, Ross Clendenin, SCTA, RCPA, Communications. Natalie, hi, Natalie. Hi, everyone. Natalie Higley representing the North Bay Labor Council. Been here um, maybe six or seven months so far. Okay. Let's see who else we got. Uh, Mosa. Hi, uh, Mosa Abbasi, Transmedia Consulting, and I am representing the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber. I don't remember how many years I'm on this committee. <laughs> <laughs> there won't be a quiz later, anyways, Mosa. Thank you. Good to see you again. Steve Perlbaugh. Hello, Steve Bertelbo representing the Sierra Club. Uh, and Moose has been here since 1905, and I've been here since 1904. Wow. Wow. A lot of changes. Mr. Ling. Brian Ling, represent the fourth district. Uh, my tenure is two years and uh, only, only uh, Zoom meeting. So hopefully someday we'll be back <laughs> in person. Yeah. That would be nice. Yeah, would be good. Tanya. Good afternoon. I'm Tanya Nareth. I'm the Director of Climate Programs for the RCPA. Fantastic. Woody. Good afternoon, all. Woody Hastings sitting in for Jerry Glaser, uh, representing the North Bay Electric Auto Association. This is my uh, first ever uh, of these meetings, I believe. Well, you got a good spot right there on the coast with those flowers right behind your head. That's a, that's a good spot to be at the meeting. Welcome. Thank you. Dennis Harder. Dennis Harder representing Sonoma County Alliance. Uh, been here on the board since the inception of 1991, 31 years. Wow. Awesome. Thank you for all you've done, Dennis. Much appreciated. Kellen Gilbert. Yes, hi, uh, lead audit partner at Pacillian Brinker, presenting the uh, financial statements to this committee. All right, thank you. And Chris Barney? Good afternoon, Chris Barney with SCTA. 
David. Good afternoon, David Roberta, SCTA staff. Okay. Sarah Owen. Part of Pazinti and Brinker, uh, the in charge on the financial statement audit. Thank you. Mark Hale. Yeah, I'm, uh, I guess I'm, I'm the one with training wheels on for today until we can, Kirk can uh, finish passing the baton. Um, and I've been on this for six minutes now. All right. <laughs> Welcome. Eris Weaver. Eris <laughs> uh, Weaver, I'm the executive director of the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition, which uh, disapproves of training wheels. Just go for it. There you go. Yeah. Training wheels are good. All right. And Robin Bartholo. Excuse Hi, everybody. Me. I'm Robin Bartholo, uh, representing Sonoma County Farm Bureau, where I'm the deputy executive director. And this is my second meeting. Mm -hmm. Suzanne is here. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Suzanne Smith, Executive Director of SCTA RCPA, Profit Cone for Halloween. There I am. Um, <laughs> nice to see all of you and uh, welcome to all the new folks, especially those rookies like Jake McKinsey. It's nice when people get involved in their community. <laughs> Uh, uh, these newcomers like to see these new bloods in here. Yeah, huh? yeah. Uh, Shauna. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Shauna Gauss, Sonoma County Transportation Authority, uh, Senior Programming and Projects. All right. Love the outfit. Love the makeup. You got contacts in there, too? Or is that you yep. realize? Oh, there we go. Wow. Pretty spooky. Yes. Orlando. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Orlando Ramirez. I'm a transportation planner with Caltrans District 4 in the Office of Multimodal System Planning. And I serve as the Sonoma County Liaison for the office. Wonderful. Well, welcome to everybody. Thank you guys for joining us on Halloween night. And we are, any public comment? I think everybody here is a member of the committee. So, Probably no public comment. If anybody has any comment on anything other than an agendized <laughs> item, now would be the time. Uh, seeing no hands raised, we'll go straight to- Chair Bly. Yes. Sorry, John. Uh, Tom, sorry, Tom had a comment. <laughs> Thank oh, you. Yeah. Um, uh, in the category of public comments, I was asked to um, just raise a general concern um, the board, I believe, the Board of Supervisors recently approved some funding for the Arnold Drive bike lane. And I had a constituent um, mention to me that they didn't understand how that project had been um, prioritized, given all the other bike and ped projects around the county, how it made its way onto the special list of climate resiliency fund projects. So I just thought I should bring that matter before this committee as an open question. And uh, we can decide if that could be uh, discussed at some point. So thank you for that. Mr. Chair, I can answer it. I don't know that yeah. it, there's going to be much discussion. The supervisor wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> thank that you, like a little project. Makes sense. I'm uh, sorry, Shauna, say that again. It is a Measure M project. Understood. So um, it was prioritized in 2004 when we passed the measure and added to the. <laughs> right. So the, the answer there was that that, that, that project was um, the, that particular district's recommendation for the Climate Resiliency Fund, uh, or it was just. I want to be sure I understand so I can relay this back. Uh, I mean, it wasn't our process. It was the county's process. Understood. So I would ask Supervisor Gorin. Thank you. Thank you. And, and no offense to anybody else, could, but can we just keep Shauna's face up on the screen with those eyeballs? That's just so damn entertaining, I think. <laughs> I'll hit it right now. <laughs> <laughs> just freeze that on the screen. Anyways, thank you, Tom, for that question and the answer, Suzanne. Um, Chair Blyan, yes. I also want to announce that we do have a quorum right now. 
So after introduction, oh, good. Okay. We, quorum. we can actually do this. So we're going to get into approval of the September 26th meeting minutes. <clears throat> it, uh, just as a, no, a, a matter of note, because it was so confusing the last meeting or two without quorums, is that only one meeting that we have to approve the minutes for, Drew? Okay. Um, so is there a motion and a second so we can discuss any modifications or accepting the minutes as posted? Move so for acceptance. We got a motion, second? Second. Second. Any discussion or corrections in the minutes for September 26th? Seeing none. Uh, just I'll, I'll go with all all those in favor. Signify with an aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. Signify nay. And any abstentions? Signify abstain. 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 One, one abstention. Two abstentions. Thank you. All right. Motion carries, and we are into defining CAC vacancies. Ross, take it away. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, this item was discussed at the September CAC meeting and is included in this packet. Um, based on that discussion, staff sent out a Google form intended to gather primary and backup contact information for its CAC members. If you have not had a chance to confirm your information, please do so before the next meeting. Um, to briefly summarize the overall item, uh, staff recommends defining a citizen's advisory vacancy as three consecutive unexcused absences at committee meeting. Once the vacancy is confirmed, the seat will not be counted when establishing a quorum. An unexcused absence will be defined as not attending a regularly scheduled CAC meeting without any notice to staff or committee chair. Staff is recommending this administrative fix that would go into effect immediately. Thank you. I have a question as part of uh, the quorum announcement. Should we be announcing so that people get a heads up um, at each meeting uh, that we have an unexcused absence or that so-and-so is, an do we need to be going to that extent or are we just going to allow staff to keep it behind the scenes and then let us know when it becomes three? We're, I, we're, we had we're, some discuss, we had some discussion on that, Ross, and it was kind of like yeah. I, I my my impression that was that we're not looking to shame or call out right. anyone. Um, we'd be happy to keep that behind the scenes and kind of notify the organization as necessary. I, I would suggest as best we can, if somebody has one or two, if staff can reach out to them and say, because I haven't gotten any calls for any. Uh, absences. So if they don't call you guys and they don't call me, I would think it's unexcused. Yeah, the, the attendance is included in the packet as well. Uh, Thank you, Russ. Yeah, I was going to add that I do track the attendance on the agenda page and that I have the check marks for present and then asterisks for letting us know that the that they'd be absent and then blank would be unexcused in that sense. Thank you, Drew. Any other comments or questions on the defining of CAC vacancies? Um, if not, I'd go to the next question, which is once we get to excusing somebody, again, we're not into shaming them, but if somebody's obviously uh, not going to be showing up and so forth, do we then notify the, I'll call them the awarding body, the, the body that appoints the seat and let them know that there's that their, their seat is vacant, that, that we need another appointment from them? Yes, we, we would be in contact, um, hopefully before we get to that point, but um, certainly we'd be in contact with them. If they, if they respond, Ross, and say, we don't have anybody, I know I've been in touch with the realtors and they, you know, Lisa B keeps saying that she's tried, but they just can't find anybody. So if they come back and say, well, we just don't have anybody, does that seat just go unfilled? It would be, it would become a vacancy for the moment, yes, and would not count towards 
uh, establish. Wouldn't count towards a quorum. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't have any other questions. Anybody else have one? Well, I guess I have a question, um, which is, does it make sense for some organizations that are not sending representatives to continue to be seated on this on this committee? Well, I thought Suzanne kind of addressed that last time. Um, that's a tough one, Tom. Um, you know, when uh, upon its inception back in 91, these were the folks that were identified as stakeholders. I suppose if there was a different stakeholder uh, to be identified in 2022, uh, a proposal at of some sort would be in order. Um, and then we'd go through whatever process we feel we need to go through, whether it goes to the, uh, the board of trustees or whether it's our choice, I don't know. I don't know how to define that. So, so Mr. Mr. Chair, this, this solution is basically um, kind of a, a shorter term way to address that. The, the roster has been updated twice um, in the past, Few years, uh, most recently um, in 2021, um, it is it, it is a process that requires board approval, and essentially this um, is the quorum issue is an administrative fix to basically avoid having to wait two board meetings to do that. Um, if if staff or if uh, the board does choose um, to go through that process, that's kind of out, outside of this question. Okay, thank you, Ross. And um, I mean, I, I guess I would just say that if, if we do have folks that are, you know, organizations that are simply, you know, not prioritizing this and not considering themselves by their behavior to be stakeholders anymore, that might be relevant to the board and that maybe we should have some kind of process for annually reporting that to the board so that we could simply keep the board informed and not have to have them be the ones looking at the uh, attendance sheet, but just that, that we maybe would make, uh, have, a, have a discussion, I would say annually. Yeah, I, I think that's probably a good idea. And, and we would uh, probably next month or December choose to have that discussion. Tom is what I'm thinking. And I mean, there's a couple of them that are obvious that just, you know, for the four or five years that we've all been very active on this, we've never seen anybody. So it's like, okay, well, um, we would recommend to the board of directors that that seat be uh, eliminated as a seat on this SCTA CAC. And then Suzanne would carry that to the board and they'd decide whatever they're going to decide. Is that how it would work, Ross? Essentially, yes, but it is modifying the administrative code. It would just be an advisory comment from us to Suzanne. And it would need, need to be presented to the board and then voted at the following meeting, I believe. Could you put that, and I'll, I'll just sit there and look for acquiescence to this. Could you put that on our calendar for the November meeting rather than the December meeting? And we'll just have a short, brief discussion. If somebody hasn't been here for a year or two, let's throw a couple names out there. And if Suzanne wants to take them to the board, that's our advice to do so. Everybody okay with that? Eris, I see you've got a comment. Yeah, I, I just kind of wanted to, I feel sort of in, line, in alignment with what Tom was saying that, you know, how do we just define a stakeholder? Is it someone who who they believe they have a stake in what's going on and want to be here or someone who we think should have it, want to have a stake in it, but isn't showing up. Um, I, I would very much like to see, you know, looking at if there's organizations that are, you know, haven't been here in, you know, a whole year. Yeah, why keep them on a, on a list somewhere? I agree. So Shauna, Shauna came back and said there's no December meeting. So thank you for that correction. So if we go ahead and do this in November, Eris, Tom, and, and Ross, and everybody, I think we kind of 
handle our bit of the business. And from that point on, it's, it's administrative from the board. So thank you guys. It's a little bit uncomfortable, but on the other hand, it's really not. If they haven't been here, they, you know, they don't want to be here, which is fine. It's a party. They don't, they don't know what they're missing. For God's sake. Well, and the, the plus side is that their name's not showing up and, and, and being, you know, yeah. as a non-attendee. So that's, that's a positive. Yeah, exactly. That's, there we go. Positive by subtracting. All right. Well, thank you, guys. Um, we're on to, oh, we're on to Pacendi and Brinker, I believe. Wait, did we actually vote? Yeah. No, I don't think there? we did. Yeah, I don't <laughs> think you did. <laughs> Uh, you beat me to it, Eris. <laughs> rem remind me, Drew, what is what are we voting on? <laughs> so we are voting on establishing the three absence, three unexcused absences equals the vacant vacancy from the committee. Great. I think in okay, all all those in favor of the defined absences and vacancy as presented by Ross and Drew. I do need a motion first, a motion in a second, and then we can vote on that. So moved. Second. No further discussion. Steve's got a, qu a hand up. I don't know if that's to vote or if we're discussing. No, that's the vote. Absolutely. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. And any abstentions, say abstain. Okay. Thank you. Another bit of business out of the way. Appreciate it. Okay, we are on to Pacetti and Brinker, our audited financials. Okay, so, thank you very much. Uh, oops. Sorry. Let me just introduce you, Kellen, and give a little context for the uh, the new folks. Uh, mm -hmm. So, Pacetti and Brinker are our independent auditors that audit our financial statements. The financial statements um, are prepared by the Auditor Controller Tax Collector's Office that um, SCTA RCPA contracts with uh, for accounting services and to prepare our financials. Uh, so the uh, the independent audit that they're going to present to you is the the annual um, audit that occurs. For the new committee members, I just want you to make, make you all aware of um, our annual report that also um, goes out typically January of each year. Um, this, this committee will see a draft of that in um, April. That's where we get into the, the individual details of all of the projects, as well as every other year we do a strategic plan of which our 2022 strategic plan um, was approved by this committee earlier this year. Um, so with, with that context uh, laid out, I'd like to pass it off to uh, um, Kellen and Sarah from Presenti and Brinker uh, to present their, their findings in the audit. Uh, take it away, Kellen. Thank you, James. <clears throat> Bear with me as I share my screen. Uh, can everybody see the first slide of the presentation? All right, I'm seeing a thumbs up. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thank you for joining, uh, joining me on Halloween or, or allowing me to join your meeting here on Halloween. Um, oh, hang on a second. Could you, could you put that in presentation mode so it's a little bigger? <clears throat> yeah, sometimes I have issues with it because now it's going to my other screen. Let's see. So on that, you would hit, there's a section that would go swap presenters view. Let me see. Is that now on the bigger screen? There we are. Great. Yeah, full screen now. Perfect. All right. Um, so as James introduced, uh, I am Kellen Gilbert. I'm the lead audit partner on the Measure M audit. Uh, also part of the team is Brett Bradford, who is the quality control reviewer. Uh, Sarah Owen, who is the audit senior associate, uh, who is also on this Zoom, and this is her third year uh, on the engagement. And Gina Roach was our audit associate who assisted us with the audit. And for those uh, new, I always like to start with this slide, uh, just to go over the responsibilities for uh, the financial statements. So 
There's a common misconception that auditors uh, draft the financial statements, but as James pointed out, uh, the auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector, who is contracted by Measure M, uh, actually prepares the financial statements and is acting on behalf of uh, Measure M as the accountant in this case. So all the financial uh, numbers and the disclosures, those are all responsibilities of management um, and all the information within is um, required that management maintains internal controls over that financial reporting. Um, as the auditor, we're responsible for giving our opinion about whether or not those financial statements, which are again prepared by the county and by Measure M, we're giving our opinion on whether or not those financial statements are uh, free of material misstatement. So in doing so, uh, we use what's called a risk-based approach. Uh, this is where we consider the different risk factors associated with the Measure M audit um, in designing the specific procedures that we're going to perform. Uh, and the purpose for this is that um, the AICPA uh, didn't want uh, auditors just to do a, a cookie cutter balance sheet audit. Um, they wanted auditors to get to know their clients and make sure that they understood where the risks were uh, so that when we spend our time auditing the different sections of the audit, that we're really getting the most bang for our buck and that we're really looking um, <laughs> the deepest in the sections that are the most risky. So when we talk about uh, <clears throat> risk, uh, we're talking about the risk of the financial statements being materially misstated uh, due to either fraud or error. And a lot of times it's just due to, due to an error. Um, and so we're looking to see which balances uh, have the highest susceptibility to, uh, to an error or to possibly to fraud. Uh, and that's how we create our risk-based audit approach and, again, determine which sections we're going to spend our time looking at. We do audit the entire financial statements, but really with this risk-based approach, we want to have a more specified, narrow, narrower view of those sections that we consider to be uh, more risky. Uh, we also consider internal control not just with Measure M, <clears throat> but also with the, the county who's acting on behalf as their uh, accountants. So we wanna make sure that they have appropriate internal controls as well. Uh, once we have established our risk-based approach, we uh, perform tests of year-end balance. That's where we're getting in the nitty gritty, uh, reviewing bank statements, looking at cash coming in, uh, verifying cash going out, uh, and those type of um, procedures that you probably associate with an audit where we're verifying one uh, source document to another document to make sure that all the numbers are tying out and all the figures look <laughs> correct. <clears throat> uh, the last bullet point there is really important. We also evaluate the adequacy of disclosures of the financial statements, which is a, a very important part of the financials. Uh, when we do that, we're looking to make sure that not only are all the required disclosures uh, that should be there are included, but we also want to make sure that uh, the notes are clean, precise, that there's not additional information that doesn't need to be in there, and really just overall, um, are those notes presented with just the factual information and, and know what we call management bias. <clears throat> uh, so I didn't mention this already, we use a risk-based approach, and I like to just give a little bit more uh, information about what we're considering when we are establishing our uh, risk-based criteria. So we consider the expertise of the accounting staff and the employees, um, both again at uh, Measure M and at the county. So the, the less turnover and the more experienced the staff are, the staff <clears throat> who are preparing the financial statements, the more experienced they are, uh, the less likely there is just to be a, a typo or a, uh, an error or um, an error created out of a um, not knowing how to account for a certain transaction. So uh, just like in all business, uh, the more experienced the staff are, the less risky uh, the, the financial statements tend to be. Uh, 
that's just one small factor that we consider. Um, the susceptibility of the account balance, that second bullet point, uh, really what that means is how complex of the underlying transactions are there within that account balance. So uh, are there complex revenue recognition criteria? Um, is there a large volume of transactions in that financial statement account or line item? Uh, really how complicated that balance is. Uh, and then anytime there's new programs or new funding sources, uh, last year there was a couple large dollar funding sources that were uh, just new and, and had a little bit of wrinkles to them. Uh, we wanna make sure that we get all of those grant agreements, uh, read through those documents and make sure that uh, the revenue recognition criteria is being met when there's any sort of a new or significant changes to existing programs. Uh, other external factors that we consider that everybody's been aware of, things like COVID-19, um, anything that could drastically reduce the Measure M sales tax. Uh, this year is up about 10%, but we had a couple of years of uh, dip um, for COVID. So we're considering what factors that might have on Measure M's abilities to pay their commitments, um, and if there's any other factors that that could cause concerns with. Uh, we also look for any new regulatory environments, uh, you know, changes to the strategic plan, anything like that. I guess that would be an internal factor, but <clears throat> um, anything that the strategic plan needs to take into account uh, for handling any sort of external uh, regulatory environment, we're always looking out for anything like that. <clears throat> So our significant areas of focus, um, we, we conducted our uh, audit using the 2019 strategic plan because that was the plan that was in place for the majority of the year. We did review the 2022 strategic plan just to make sure that uh, there were any significant changes that would have affected our auditing procedures. Uh, we look at the revenue bond compliance, making sure that uh, payments are being made, the amounts that are disclosed are correct, um, just making sure that everything's uh, being sent to the right account on the right time, uh, making sure that, again, payments are, are timely. We look at grant revenue and receivables uh, compliance. Sometimes those grant agreements can have rather complex compliance uh, revenue recognition uh, criteria. So we wanna make sure that if there are certain types of qualified expenditures that need to be made before uh, that revenue can be recognized, we, we look at those areas. <clears throat> And then we look at the uh, financial statements. Again, uh, we say complete and without bias. That basically means that are all the required disclosures there and are there any disclosures where management potentially could uh, put their thumb on the scale? Measure M's uh, disclosures are, are pretty cut and dry, uh, but we just wanna make sure that if there was any area where uh, there was wording that management was heavily involved in crafting or if there were significant estimates, we wanna make sure that we feel comfortable that those are, again, factual based and uh, without bias. So this is just a really rough uh, general idea of where we spend our time during the Measure M audit. Uh, compliance with that strategic plan is the largest percentage of our time and effort. Uh, that's been true in past audits and will continue to be the case just because that is the area that could have the biggest impact on Measure M's financial statements. Uh, grant revenue and revenue recognition, uh, accounts receivable, making sure that the Measure M revenue, uh, sales tax revenue is being allocated to the appropriate funds. That is again, uh, the next largest part of our audit. Uh, and, then, and then the rest, accounts payables, accrued um, liabilities and other liabilities, uh, interfunds, uh, due to and due froms, uh, other, other sections, approximately 20% combined. And then the disclosures are about 20% as well. <clears throat> uh, as previously mentioned, uh, that the compliance with the Measure M uh, strategic plan and the appropriate allocation of the sales tax revenue continues to be uh, the biggest area of the audit. Uh, we want to make sure that all the revenue is allocated in accordance with the strategic plan. And then we want to make sure that the expenditures that are recorded in a given year, that those are being allocated appropriately among the various funds. And that again, those expenses are 
um, in accordance with the strategic plan for the purposes as intended within the strategic plan. So making sure that those expenditures are all recorded within the right funds. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, the timely measure M bond activity, uh, timely payments, maintenance of the debt uh, reserves and uh, the debt service funds, making sure that those are uh, properly maintained uh, and segregation of the uh, debt proceeds as well. At this point, we are approximately 95% done with the audit. And what that means is we are essentially complete with the audit. Uh, we are not anticipating any other changes. Um, we're basically just at the point where we're waiting uh, for the various uh, committees and boards to um, have a chance to review the financials and, and give their blessing. But at this point, we do not anticipate any other changes. Uh, and we are anticipating issuing an unqualified opinion, meaning that we believe the financial statements are free of material error. And we found no instances of uh, material non-compliance. Uh, so again, those are the highest marks that we can give. We had essentially no issues with the measure and financial statements, kind of bearing the lead there, but uh, that's the most important aspect to this committee. Um, again, an unqualified opinion and no uh, material non-compliance. <clears throat> we did not encounter any fraud, illegal acts, disagreement with management, which would be a, a situation where uh, there was some vagary of, of how to handle a certain accounting transaction and management thought it should be one way and we thought it should be another way. We, we did not have any such disagreements. Uh, no unusual transactions, again, where there might be some uh, uncertainty of how to account for something. We didn't have anything like that. and We did not have any material audit adjustments. These are communications that we are required to report to those charged with governance, which includes this committee. And so we just want to go through these and, and make sure that we communicate to you that we did not encounter any of these issues. Uh, again, this is continuing of those communications, no material audit adjustments, uh, no alternative accounting treatment, and there were no uh, significant changes to accounting policies for Measure M. Um, or any, anything else that we'd want to draw your attention to within the financial statements that would be a, a significant change from, from past years. Uh, again, a uh, little bit of a repeat from last slide, but I, I do want to say I've, I've been working uh, on this account for many years now, and I think this was probably the smoothest audit that we have had. It's typically a, a pretty smooth audit, but I, I want to uh, give my appreciation to the Measure M and SCTA staff that this was probably our uh, most smooth audit in recent memory, so thank you. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions either with the presentation or the financial statements. I'm gonna end this slide show and uh, happy to answer any questions. Kellen, I have a question actually, not from you, but uh, really uh, from management or just for clarification, if I could. And so it's gonna be in the supplemental uh, information. And I'm just looking for clarification or understanding. Um, it, it looks like there's in the, our expenditures um, that we, you know, from our budget to actual, that we underspent 12 million five. And, and so I assume that's, uh, local streets and low road projects. And I assume that's uh, uh, the um, overpass, but, but uh, if not, could you just let me know exactly what was budgeted before that we didn't spend our money on? If you, James is probably one of yours, huh? Yeah, so, so um, I'm not following the, this is a page We're within at, the, I'm, so I, I understand I'm, the gist of the, the question and I think section. I have an answer. So it's, what, it's can you give me a page 12, number? A, 10, a 14, there you go. Page 14. <clears throat> so a, a difference okay. between the uh, contributions to other governments um, yeah. in the original budgeted amount and then the final budgeted amount. You got it. Yeah, gotcha. So, 
I, I'd have to go in and look at project okay. by project basis, but I can, I mean, I can, I can tell you a couple, a couple things, you know, just right off the top of my head with regard to delivery of projects, right? Um, one that rings a bell that's probably to the tune of uh, over $5 million is, you know, Fulton Road, where we budget for $7 million in expenditures, and the city is not delivering Fulton Road in one year, right? They end up sure. ex extending those expenditures over multiple years. So what we do is we're under contract with them to deliver up to those dollar amounts each year. And, uh, and, and so we budget for those entire amounts. When their schedule slips, then we have large carryover amounts that happen between our preliminary budget and our final budget. Um, each year. This is an example of that. If you'd like me to go into more detail between the Highway 101 program, LSP, and Bike Ped, which are the three programs that will impact these amounts, um, it'll be money going to Caltrans for the 101 project. It'll be money to go into, you know, one of our 10 jurisdictions for the Bike Ped and LSP program. For those programs, I, I can provide that information. Yeah, yeah, offline, that'd be great. I assume that'll come up also in the actual uh, report that comes out that's in detail by by uh, the annual report, it would probably come out there too. I just thought uh, uh, I didn't know if it was the whole overpass that would, that we didn't get through or something else that. Uh, so that was really I was just looking for a big number what it was so I understood more of what was going on. Thank you. Yeah, happy to follow up with that. Are there any other questions on either any of our procedures or the financial statements? Um, well, again, uh, I wanna thank everybody for having us and uh, for con continuing to use us as your auditor. And uh, again, appreciation to the Measure M and SCTA staff for all their help during the audit. Thank you. Thanks, Kellen. Thanks, James. So, uh, Ross, do we have an action item here? We, or was that just information only? Or are we supposed to uh, take a vote to approve the audited? Uh, counting. Uh, I believe that was an informational item. Thank you. Okay. Nice compliment to staff there, you guys. Uh, Sonoma County VMT mitigation and reduction calculator. Chris Barney. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Let me go ahead and bring up some slides here. All right. Large as possible. These are getting older. Looks good, Chris. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to be here this afternoon to uh, talk to the committee about the Sonoma County Vehicle Miles Traveled Mitigation and Reduction Calculator, which we released in August. Uh, so the calculator provides a tool that local planning and engineering staff and also developers can use to estimate the effectiveness of different mitigation approaches at reducing VMT. Uh, so in this presentation, I'll be uh, providing some background on the project, including some information on Senate Bill uh, 743 and uh, vehicle miles traveled and providing a pretty high overview um, on the tool. Uh, but I would offer on the SHA website, we do have a wealth of detailed information on the tool and VMT uh, if you really want to dig into this in more detail, including some um, exciting video demonstrations and training sessions on using the tool. So that's all available on our website. So I encourage you to uh, check that out if you're interested in that. Uh, so starting out with a little bit of information about SB 743, 
Uh, so it's one of the primary reasons for the current focus on vehicle miles traveled. Uh, SB 743 eliminated. Could I delay. ask, uh, uh, can we move that over, Chris, so that, I don't know how yeah. to do that. Center it somehow so that the, Is the, the, uh, the individual word? pictures of guys aren't, aren't taking some of the wording away. That's not happening on my screen. It's it's your your settings, John. Okay, so I go Hit to the minus button. button. Either that, or you can drop and drag if you have a second screen. You can just drop. Thank and you. Drag Got it. All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, about I was that. looking for trying to fix it, but okay. You're on an we iPad, you can eliminate the photos at the bottom. Okay. All good. All right. Um, so yeah, SP seven forty three. Uh, eliminated delay congestion or level of service as a CEQA or California Environmental Quality Act metric um, in an effort to reduce emissions, promote multimodal travel, and encourage infill development. So the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, or OPR, uh, was given the task of finding an alternative me metric to level of service. And through much deliberation, they identified vehicle miles traveled as the preferred me metric for measuring transportation impacts as part of the environmental process. So SB 743 changes where significant transportation impacts are generally found. So under level of service, those were usually found in central areas of uh, cities. And under VMT, uh, the less dense areas on the edge of communities are generally found to have um, more impacts. So the focus of mitigation also changes under the new metric. Uh, under congestion, uh, the focus was really on congestion reduction and moving vehicles. Um, and under VMT, the shift of mitigation is really um, shifting from congestion reduction to reducing total travel. Um, so SB 743 has been worked on for quite some time, but the implementation deadline was back in July 1st of 2020. So SETA has been um, doing what we can to help support lo local jurisdictions as they're implementing uh, this uh, state requirement. So let me go ahead and make sure I'm advancing try out the slides here. Um, so just talking a little bit about vehicle miles traveled, uh, congestion is pretty easy to see and measure. You can actually walk out to a, um, you know, a road segment and see how fast or slow cars are going. You can count the number of cars that are moving through an intersection and how fast that's occurring to get a, a really accurate look at congestion levels. But VMT is um, much more conceptual and it's a higher level metric. So at its very simplest level, VMT represents the number of trips a person or household makes during the day and multiplies it by how long those trips are. So if a person makes five trips in a day um, and each of those trips is 10 miles long, the person would generate uh, 50 daily VMT. Uh, the VMT measures the amount of vehicle travel happening in a city, region, or county, or other area, but it's often expressed as a per person or per employee efficiency metric. So VMT measures total travel activity, not congestion, and is really looking at the bigger picture or regional impact of travel. So the states really provided um, you know, a few examples of, of how to contextualize this and consider what type of trip we should prioritize um, when considering VMT. So um, on one hand, consider a 45 minute commute trip uh, where you're just flying along the freeway, but at the end of that trip, you hit five minutes of congestion. So it's a pretty long trip, but um, you know, it's, pretty convenient and not too painful as far as congestion goes. Uh, so this type of trip would receive a good level of service grade, but it's, you know, the access isn't very good, right? It's a pretty long trip. Uh, you can compare that to a shorter trip that's less than half the length of that 20 minute commute trip, but a good deal of that, about half of it is through congested roadways. So um, in this case, if we were using level of service as a metric to measure that, it would receive a bad level of service grade, but it represents much better accessibility and a lot less travel um, than that first trip. Uh, so OPR just asks us, asks us to consider this and as part of uh, the state's deliberation on you know, why VMT is a good way to measure transportation impacts. This is an example of uh, how we should be considering that. 
There are also a lot of additional benefits of using DMT um, as a transportation impact um, for our communities, including things like streamlining different development types, including transit-oriented development, uh, development in infill areas, making it easier to develop transit and active transportation projects. Uh, it also makes it easier to um, streamline local serving services uh, in these, these built up areas. Uh, it can help address regional versus local congestion, um, make it easier to maintain our roadways and our transportation systems. Uh, it can certainly improve public health and safety and reduce greenhouse gas and other emissions as well. So uh, SETA is generally, generally not a lead agency, so we're not building a lot of local, we're not building any local development projects. So uh, the cities and local planning departments are generally the lead agencies um, in this case. Uh, so they're in the trenches implementing uh, these requirements, but SETA is, is able to provide support, especially technical support um, as they're working on this. Uh, so most of the support is focused on data, modeling, and forecasting, including things like sh sharing information and providing education. Uh, we have standing items on the SETA technical and planning advisory committee meetings to talk about uh, implementation for BMT and SB 743. Uh, we've um, held a number of webinars and other trainings as well to talk about BMT reduction um, and measurement. Uh, we also produce and host BMT screening maps showing high and low BMT generating areas. Uh, we can use our travel model and other tools and data resources to estimate BMT for projects and for setting local policy. And then finally, um, just in August, we wrapped up the development of the Sonoma County BMT mitigation and reduction calculator, which was released last, or not last month, but back in August. Um, and which can be used to help local staff and developers determine how effective the mitigation approaches for projects can be. So the process for analyzing BMT for projects pretty in depth, but um, I'll try and provide a high level and simplified summary of the basic steps that um, are followed to analyze project level BMT. <clears throat> so the first step is um, to eat to determine whether or not a project VMT even needs to be uh, analyzed. And the state has recommended that certain low VMT projects can be screened out and don't have to be analyzed at all. Uh, so these project screens are generally based on project size. So smaller projects uh, can be screened out. Project types can as well. Um, location in low VMT areas, that's tied back to those, those maps that we produce and other criteria, including things like housing affordability, uh, can be used to identify other low BMT projects. So if it's determined that a project BMT does need to be analyzed, BMT needs to be calculated um, using some sort of method or formula. So the Sonoma County travel model is available to do that, uh, or trip generation formulas or other BMT estimators or calculators can be used to do that. Uh, so that's a pretty straightforward process that um, folks preparing traffic uh, studies are, are very familiar with. So once you have that BMT calculation done, um, project BMT is compared to local BMT thresholds. Uh, so uh, a good portion of jurisdictions in the county have set thresholds on, you know, how high of a BM, BMT level will generate a, an impact. If they don't have those in place, the state has actually uh, set some recommendations as well. So that's kind of the fallback if the local threshold isn't in place. So if the VMT estimate is higher than that threshold, uh, VMT needs to be mitigated. Um, and that's where the mitigation calculator and tool comes in. It helps calculate how effective different approaches would be at uh, mitigating those VMT impacts. So um, our tool, the Sonoma County BMT Mitigation and Reduction Tool, is a spreadsheet-based tool built on applications that were, that were developed uh, for the San Diego region and Alameda County. And it allows the user to enter project type and location and estimate BMT reductions using information from our travel model uh, and BMT and GHG reduction research. So we also um, convened a project steering committee make up, made up of local planning and engineering staff to help guide the development 
of the tool and prioritize what should be included in it. So as I said before, we released it at a countywide online training session on August 25th. Uh, and the tool and associate documentation are all available on the SEK website, along with a recording of that training session. So I'm not going to go into a, a huge amount of detail on the tool, but I did want to provide just a little bit <laughs> of a flavor of what's in there. Um, so one thing that's really important um, when, one thing that was very important when setting up this tool was uh, developing substantial evidence for all the, the VMT mitigations included in the tool. Um, and that's really important for those mitigations to be defensible as part of the environmental process. So, um, you know, all of the calculations and quantifications in the tool really need to be based on actual data and research. So uh, each of the mitigations in the tool is actually tied back to a number of different sources and studies that have been performed. and. Um, uh, the consultants we worked with, Baron Peers, uh, did a really good job of documenting all that. So it's a, a pretty easy um, breadcrumb, breadcrumb trail to kind of get back to that research that was completed. Uh, it also really needs to be locally uh, appropriate. So the tool was built on the bones of some of these other tools developed for other regions and other areas, but we were able to use some of our local data sources from the travel model and the travel behavior study to really make that um, reflect local conditions. And then it's a piece of software um, and research is developing in this area a lot, right? Like um, how VMT can be reduced and how effective different approaches will be to do that. So um, as that develops and as things change, um, we can actually open the hood in the tool and, and update it and make sure it's uh, still relevant uh, for Sonoma County um, for uh, the current time period. So there are about 30 uh, different BMT uh, reduction strategies included in the tool. I'm not going to go through all of them. There's a great deal of information on each of these in the, um, the documentation for the tool. And it ties it back to that research, including the formulas and everything like that, too. So I, I encourage you, if you're interested in that, to take a look at that and um, a lot of good information there. Uh, but there are generally two types of mitigation approaches included in the tool. There are approaches that are really focused on reducing travel and VMT at the individual project scale, uh, including um, all of these different examples here uh, on the slide right now. Those focused on land use, increasing density, um, trip reduction programs, including van pools and um, subsidizing transit programs. Um, and also parking pricing and management as well. So limiting parking supply and um, charging for parking. Uh, and then there are also strategies focused on the community or jurisdiction scale. So looking at neighborhood design, like improving the overall bike uh, network or pedestrian network or implementing bike or scooter share programs and also improving transit programs, um, you know, increasing including more service or um, lowering the cost of transit. Uh, so set, as I said before, there's a lot of additional information on this available on our website. Uh, the URL is, is here, but if you go to the SETA website and search for SP743 or BMT, it'll take you right there. Or if you look for uh, the forecasting um, and data resources link um, at the SETA website, that'll take you there as well. But um, yeah, there, there's a lot of information here. I didn't want to um, go too in depth, but um, happy to be able to provide this high level overview on, on this project for the committee. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair, and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I see Eris has her hand up. Um, yeah, thanks. I guess my question is, uh, and I know I can go look at the data too, but the, the granularity in terms of all that list of interventions and how, you know, that they will mitigate um, the increased VMT. Um, and, and does that include sort of an ROI, like this intervention will reduce it more than that intervention? And are the interventions granular enough, like saying, okay, make bike facilities, but there's a big difference in say a class two versus a class one bikeway. So I guess I'm just curious about that. 
Yeah, thanks for that. That's, you know, that's a really important question. So all of these measures are quantified. So there is a, a quantified VMT reduction attached to each of the measure. On the bike lane type specifically, um, I don't know. I believe it differentiates between class ones and class twos, but I can't tell you off the top of my head, but that's something I can certainly check on and get back to you on. Uh, if it doesn't, I can't think of it as being very accurate because I mean, one makes such a huge difference in terms of getting new cyclists out. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it does, but I'm not going to say without checking first. So I will do that. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Eris. Jake? Um, yeah, I'm just curious, Chris. Um, can, can you give us an example of a, a development project that has utilized all the tools that uh, you've just been describing to us? I know that the major development projects in Runner Park which are underway, I'm not sure that they utilize these tools. Yeah, it's it's so new, right? Um, I've only heard of one instance of the tool being used so far since it was just released in August. Um, I know the city of Katadi was looking at uh, a housing project um, down there and they were able to uh, look at some densities to actually you know, increase in densities to reduce the VMT there. But um, yeah, there, you know, this is something I keep asking about. It's new on the street and I don't have any current examples yet, but um, hopefully we will see some soon and I'd be happy to come back to the committee yeah. and report out on how it's being used. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chair, if I might suggest as we, um, you know, move into the year 2023 that um, we ask staff to flag uh, maybe a, a good example of a development project that has been subjected, if you will, that's probably not a good choice of words, but has, util has utilized uh, this tool and just see, see how it played out. I'd love to have seen this utilized on the Sonoma Mountain Village uh, uh, project, but unfortunately, the CEQA analysis and that is, you know, is a number of years away back in history. Thank you, Jake. Thanks, Chrissy. I agree. Um, I, I'm going to jump in the queue here real quickly because it kind of segues off of Jake's question a little bit. I'm a little bit, th there's so much power in this, Chris, and there's so much information in this. I'm always concerned that it can get misused any number of ways. So the other thing I'd like to be able to follow either from the engineers or developers uh, perspective is if it's being weaponized in some way by, <laughs> by well, no, no, by a, 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 a project, let's say Trader Joe's wants to put a supermarket in on the corner of A and B street and Oliver's doesn't want it there. Um, is there some way to weed out the CEQA challenges with this, with this spreadsheet to take into account competitor, competitors' pissing, pissiness, I guess? That's a technical term, I think, Kurt. You have that uh, competitor's pissiness. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm just worried about it being used to uh, derail an otherwise good project, if you will. And then I'll step back and let Steve and Tom and Tom have questions. Yeah, so Mr. Chair, would you like me to make a quick response to that or just kind Yeah, of I don't even know if it's answerable, but yeah. <laughs> I don't even know if it's answerable, Chris, but it, it, if it is, is there some mechanism in there to challenge the challenges, if you will? So everything's locked down. Um, so in order for someone to go in there and alter the formulas, they'd have to hack the tool. So they'd have to be pretty so sophisticated to start doing that. Um, and in the end, the lead agency really has to sign off on the analysis that's done using the tool. So if, if they present, you know, someone uses the tool and presents something to local staff and it looks kind of fishy, um, 
they can always say, hey, we want to take a look at this. You know, they could contact me. We could take a look at the formulas. And, um, you know, they can do the math by hand using the formulas and compare the math and see if it doesn't line up. So yeah, there are some ways to check on that for sure. And, you know, I'm always happy to help support uh, the local staff with, with those sorts of issues. Thank you, Chris. Steve? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yes, Chris, uh, uh, the Air Resources Board is coming up with a formula for reducing VMT over the next 20 years or so. Um, and uh, it may result in about a requirement for a 1% year reduction um, or annual reduction. How, how, how does this model uh, fit into the, the prospect that over time, uh, VMT needs to be reduced? Yeah, this is, uh, thanks for that, Steve. So this is part of the bigger picture, right? Like this is SB743 is really, um, a product of those ARB goals and, you know, is really intended to help, you know, the state meet those reductions, right? And so um, this tool specifically is something that the local jurisdictions can use to figure out how to reduce the VMT for those individual projects, right? So the state gives the requirement and those percentage reductions, but, you know, how do you translate that to a a project happening in a jurisdiction. And this tool is, is something that's intended to help out with that, right? Here are some things you can do to help mitigate those VMT projects that that project may be um, bringing along with it. So, um, you know, this isn't telling us how to get there, um, but how an individual project can um, help us get there. So a small piece of the puzzle. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Steve. I'm apologetic. That was much more intelligent than my pissy, pissiness coefficient question. <laughs> Tom Banning. Hi. My understanding is traffic peaks in places like Santa Rosa with the school year. Does the model have any school specific school year, school commute features built into it? Um, so the VMT tool does not, but the travel model definitely does. Um, so the, the travel model includes enrollments for all the schools across the county and um, looks at, you know, peak uh, impacts across the days. And it's really looking at the, the peak of the peak. So during the school year. Um, so um, to answer your question, yes, it, it's looking at school impacts on travel, um, and we've recently been able to also implement a weekend travel model as well. So that gives us kind of an idea of what things look like without school in session, um, with a lot of other things going on as well. But yeah, there, you know, that we're definitely aware that schools have a pretty huge impact on travel patterns, right? Um, and so that's definitely part of our overall my forecasting analysis approach here at the county. And I'm, yeah, always happy to talk about that. If you want to talk about modeling, how we do that, um, reach out to me, happy to, to talk to you about that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Question, Tom. Thank you, Chris. Tom Conlon. Yeah, thank you. And uh, congratulations, Chris. This looks like finally ready for, for us to roll with it. And it's a, it's a great tool. Um, I, I like Jake's Good question about implementation, and uh, I, I do agree that it'd be helpful to bring that back to us to get sort of case studies of how it's being used and or misused because there is, you know, it's a powerful tool, as, as John said. Um, one of the things I'm trying to reconcile is it seems like it has come out, the publication and availability of the model and this, this calculator are are actually falling outside of the window where the, they could have been used for several of the county's specific plans, um, which is unfortunate, I think, in retrospect, especially since we've seen a couple of those plans find that they cannot mitigate vehicle miles traveled increases. So I, I was curious if you were willing to say anything, sort of touch that third rail, <laughs> Uh, issue, 
but uh, reflect on the, the phasing of the availability of this. You know, SB 743 has been around for a long time. It's, it's taken a long time to get us to this point. So that's my first question. Then I've got a follow-up question about something going on in Napa that I just wanted your opinion on. Yeah, so, you know, we're, we're always gonna be a little behind, right? Um, there are gonna be requirements that are gonna come out that are important and we're all scrambling to figure out how to implement it, right? Um, and this is a really big shift. Um, you know, level of service congestion has really been the, the thing that's been looked at for years and years and years. And, you know, it was hugely controversial to make this shift in the first place. And, um, you know, even learn how to do the BMT calculations correctly, right? Um, at its face value, it's pretty simple, but when you get down to it and slice and dice in different ways, it gets pretty complicated. So. Um, you know, I, we've made a lot of progress on being able to do that and get these tools out there, but unfortunately, um, stuff wasn't ready to, you know, help analyze some of these big important projects, right? So that being said, um, you know, a lot of the work that was done for this project, um, you know, the research could be looked at to help figure things out as those plans are implemented, right? So the plan is one piece of that, but when projects are actually implemented as part of that plan, um, this tool could really be used to help address VMT impacts at that point. So, you know, I think there are some opportunities there for sure. Cool, thank you, Chris. I appreciate yeah. that response because that's yeah. that's exactly right is that the plans are at the early end of this, but the projects will need to go through specific reviews and that's where we can maybe make some of these improved mitigations. Yep. Um, in Napa, I noticed in their recent greenhouse gas inventory that it was gonna be presented on Friday and they canceled the meeting. Napa County has a big greenhouse gas inventory going on. They came up with a very, um, to me at least, counterintuitive finding that transportation is responsible for only about 29% on-road transportation is only responsible for about 29% of Napa's uh, collective greenhouse gas emissions. The building sector is responsible for 40. And I just, I haven't had a time to dig into it to really see if I understand why they're coming to that conclusion. Um, but just on its face, it's, it's a bit, does that also seem to you to be a counterintuitive finding because I know the state has also a similar profile to the county of Sonoma does in terms of transportation being a major impact. Yeah, the only thing I can say to that, it's definitely different than the findings here in Sonoma County in the state. So let's take that. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look into it a little more. Yeah. Um, it, uh, it's interesting. I wondered if the methodology that, that's at the root of it is perhaps inadequate in some manner. And that's what I hope hope to make a correct, you know, correct it before it before it goes too far. You wouldn't want Napa and Sonoma to be operating on two totally different approaches to what what the, the priority climate action target is. Okay. Thank you. Tom, Tom as you do that, can you give me a buzz or a, a text or an email or something? I'd like to kind of track that as well because that is completely upside down from from the other studies that uh, I've heard of. And I, I just wonder if their ulterior motive has some, I, I can't even imagine what they're trying to do with that number, yeah. making it lower lower than it would be expected to be. Yeah, my, my hope is that it's a junior person at the analysis monitor and that they've simply forgotten to, you know, add something into the equation. Uh, it's, a, it's a draft. It's very much a draft yeah. process, but I'll, I'll keep an eye on it, let you guys know. Appreciate it, thank you. Tanya may have an answer for it right now. Tanya? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have an answer, but I, I do know that Napa um, worked with a consultant to do their inventory. And so I will also take a quick look to see if I can um, see what the differences might be. It's, it's very possible that they haven't made as much progress on their building energy reduction in emissions as Sonoma County has. So it, it, it could just be that they have a sector that has greater emissions um, than we do, but I'd be happy to take a look at it and could let you know. Thank you. I had a question of Kurt too. Have you, Kurt, have you guys utilized this this new VMT calculator in any of your projects yet, or is it too new to even be doing that yet? Now, I'm just wondering: easy to use, hard to use? Does it add 
a tremendous amount of time to the timeline? I would just say it's it's new and uh, having been uh, recently retired, my experience is now fading into uh, into history, I think. And so uh, <laughs> I didn't I didn't have any many projects that went through under uh, under the, the new BMT rules other than I think there might have been one that just it was small enough that that it fell under the threshold. So it wasn't really anything that needed to be looked at. But um, I guess that's a that's part of what others following me will uh, will figure out. Um, Mark might I don't know that he's he might have some experience yeah, on no. that. I don't. It it hasn't come up to this point, John, but it's still pretty new. I, I wish projects came in faster than that, but they don't. <laughs> Appreciate it. Well, that's a great report, uh, Chris. Thank you very much. And a lot of good questions. And, you know, it, uh, it remains to be seen uh, how quickly this is implemented and how, how well it's implemented. I mean, the, it's got all the, the power and the tools to be implemented properly. I hope it is. So thank you, Chris, for that report. Thank you. And we are on to resilient SR37, Mr. Cameron. So the next item on your agenda has a little bit of material that's in the packet. Uh, I also have about a 10 minute presentation to go through to give the committee a full update on what's happening on the Resilient 37 program. You could do, there we go. And then click here, get that alt tab down. That's the trick. And then share screen, I'm gonna share this one and go ahead and click share. All right, so uh, Highway 37 uh, is better referred to as a multi-billion dollar uh, program of projects and programs called Resilient State Route 37. Excuse me while I just organize my screen. Here we go. Uh, Highway 37, a little bit of background, right? It's a lifeline, lifeline evacuation and emergency route. It is the recovery route for the uh, Richmond Sarafell Bridge, about approximately a 20 mile long corridor that when it does close down, the alternatives uh, to the north and the south are uh, over 40 miles each, and they are both along congested corridors uh, that already can't handle the traffic that uh, they're they're having to deal with. Uh, the program itself, uh, going through the key elements, are to address sea level rise aimed at preventing those closures that happened in 2017 and 2019, uh, creating an ecological connectivity critical to the restoration of the baylands with outstanding opportunities for ecological enhancement. Yeah, it actually implements bus transit and incentivizes carpooling with a multimodal approach, creates access to the baylands, and addresses equity with uh, means-based tolling or income-based tolling uh, it, that also creates access to jobs from the most affordable housing in the Bay Area, which is Solano County. There are both near-term and future work on uh, State Route 37 as part of the Resilient 37 program. Uh, the near-term work and the future work are moving forward on parallel paths and complement each other. An update as to where we are at, the Fort County Policy Committee has been meeting since 2015, four to six times per year. In June of 2018, a corridor plan was developed and established uh, and was established with extensive public input. That corridor plan is coming to fruition. Uh, the final public meeting for the planning and environmental linkages uh, was completed in September. Uh, it was September 14th was the date of that meeting. There is a link in your packet that can go into a full presentation or the um, actually full video of the um, discussion, but I'm gonna break it down to just a couple slides for you. There was 10 alignments that were vetted through three levels of detailed filters. 
uh, those filters implemented uh, 43 different screening criteria to evaluate alternative alignment that were from traffic and transportation to environmental and feasibility. The preferred alternative is a causeway on or near the existing alignment. This shows the uh, blue along the existing alignment where a new causeway would be proposed to be constructed. The, the green are, is where you have elevated sections that are not subject to the threat of sea level rise. So it would be embankment or you'd essentially be um, widening or improving, improving the roadway as needed in those green sections. This is a cross section of what that causeway is proposed to look like, essentially two lanes in each, each direction. There is a proposal for a, a wider shoulder to allow for a shoulder running lane. Uh, as well as a, a 14 foot wide bicycle and pedestrian access for the entire length of the corridor. That's the, the, the future work that's advancing on a parallel path to our near term work. I'm going to talk now about two different near term projects, starting out with the Sears Point to Mare Island Improvement Project. This is a project to address the transportation need on the corridor from Sears Point to Mare Island. The key project components are a new uh, uh, carpool lane or high occupancy vehicle lane, uh, ITS or intelligent transportation system components uh, that will also help implement that means based tolling uh, that's moving forward uh, contingent on a separate approval. This is where there's a nice tie in to the presentation that was just received uh, from Chris about SB 743. The means-based tolling doesn't only implement uh, the, it, the, a revenue source that allows you to implement those near-term and future projects. Means-based tolling also allows us to address SB 743 compliance. Uh, the, it creates a, uh, a carpool lane that instead of increasing VNT and increasing GHG, by adding that effective strategy of pricing, or in this case, means-based tolling, that, that will manage VMT, it will reduce it, and um, essentially allow the project to um, move forward uh, with, with, that, with that as the mitigation, as opposed to some of those other mitigations that um, Chris showed you earlier. This project also will implement a uh, new bus transit service, uh, public access uh, improvements to the Baylands, as well as the early ecological opportunities. The environmental document uh, that was circulated had three different alternatives. Uh, the preferred alternative is planned for release in December, uh, just a couple months away of this year. The project is proposed at grade. Uh, as you as I went through those slides fairly quickly, but of the alternatives, they're all to essentially widen uh, the existing roadway. So it'll still be subject to sea level rise and future flood, flooding from Sears Point to Mare Island. Although we have not had um, you know significant closures for that stretch, the significant closures have been further towards uh, uh, Marin County uh, in the Nevado Creek area. But this illustrates that. Um, the user benefits of delay for those folks that are needing to commute from Solano County to jobs in Marin and Sonoma County uh, essentially equates to about $85 million annually and a $430 million, $430 million project that's being proposed uh, would be more than paid for within a five year uh, period of operation, uh, of which moving forward on that ultimate project. It could easily be in operation for 10 to 20 years uh, to advance a project of that scale and magnitude uh, through the Sears Point to Mare Island stretch while we're also advancing uh, causeway sections from Highway 101 all the way up to Sears Point and causeway that's needed um, east of Mare Island. This is to update what's happening with that 743 compliance and the process that's uh, available to the project to implement tolling. It is an existing CTC authority. Uh, it's no longer uh, being proposed as SB 1050 as SB 1050 did not pass 
uh, the assembly for uh, this legislative cycle. The, the CTC authority that's granted is to toll that new capacity. So the cross section that's shown in front of you, as you can see, there's a, there's a, exist, the widening at existing grade uh, that would then have a full toll that would be similar to the toll of the other toll bridges around the Bay Area. And then the existing lane that's out there could be converted to a carpool lane and that would not that would be a free alternative to really incentivize those uh, carpoolers on the corridor. The study that's been done that will be fully funded with the proposed funding for Sears Point to Mare Island will implement transit uh, on the corridor between Vallejo and Novato. Uh, the exact location this is draft because the location could be you know, the Novato Transit Mall, or it could be, you know, locations further to the south. Uh, there's been discussion about the, uh, you know, transit hub in um, San Rafael as a potential location as well. But the funding includes uh, all electric shuttles as well as in route charging and site improvements at those transit stops uh, in Solano and Marin County. Project would also advance uh, public access. This is a section of the Bay Trail where there's a, a, a nice opportunity for a gap closure between five miles of uh, trail on the west side of Tole Creek and uh, approximately uh, three miles of trail on the east side of Tole Creek. This connector, whether it was directly parallel to the uh, highway or cut across Tole Creek will um, it bridge a gap that uh, is an opportunity to be included uh, as part of the project. The other ecological enhancements that we're working with the resource agencies on now uh, include two, two major components. One is what's referred to as the Strip Marsh East. You can see this uh, exhibit that was prepared by the Water Board. Uh, um, Creek East is that uh, you can see that this is a vegetated portion where I'm pointing to with the, with the red dot. Uh, strip marsh east, the vegetation is degraded and uh, eroding. The uh, environment is, is uh, ripe for a uh, environmental enhancement to allow for um, the pickle weed to thrive and to reestablish that uh, connectivity to the bay with tides. So you've cut channels through this area um, to allow the environment to restore itself. And then the other one is in addition to Strip Marsh East is to lengthen the Tolle Creek Bridge to allow for those upstream restoration projects within um, the lower Sonoma Creek and Tolle Creek Baylands. Here's the delivery schedule for the Sears Point to Mare Island project. I wanted to point out it is a near-term project. It can sometimes be referred to as the interim B project and the environmental document would be released later this year and could be in construction as soon as fiscal year 25, 26. The other near-term project is US 101 Atherton to Marin County. And that project started out as a flood control project addressing uh, flooding to year 2050. There's been a, uh, a, a public meeting, public scoping meeting on it. There's been a lot of talk about sea level rise uh, options in 2050 and making these improvements interim uh, before a, a future project was to be implemented. Well, this slide in front of you shows what Caltrans was recommending in June to the policy committee with uh, sea level rise projections uh, to 2050, replacing Novato Creek Bridge as the minimum option or a causeway all the way from Highway 101 to Atherton Avenue undercrossing at $1.5 billion. Caltrans and TAM are, are reevaluating the schedule. You can see the schedule does not have any dates inputted in because there is an opportunity to pivot on this project to look at developing it not just for sea level rise to 2050, but sea level rise to 2130. Uh, because the Pell has selected one alternative and is not looking anymore at alternatives off of the existing alignment, that's what allows this project to, um, to pivot, if you will. In summary, I'll bring it all back with talking about the future phasing, which is we need to complete the Pell. 
start environmental compliance work. This is the CEQA, CEQA NEPA work, you know, looking at the causeway east of Atherton because the CEQA NEPA work on the um, causeway between um, 101 and Atherton is already advancing. There needs to be more discussion about prioritization of projects and programs, as well as integrating landscape scale ecological enhancements. And then those near-term projects, the projects that you'll see the work happening on um, the soonest will be the, the causeway um, from 101 to Atherton Avenue uh, with a projected sea level rise of 2030 is, is what's being looked at now and beginning work with the most vulnerable location there at Novato Creek and then the State Route 121 to Mare Island project, which is really a transportation equity project to widen the roadway, adding a carpool lane, and on a parallel path, advance that replacement of Tole Creek Bridge, as well as smart planning. The, uh, the smart planning component is critical. As you'll see, the six entities across the bottom of your screen now are part of an MOU to help advance this resilient State Route 37 program. In December, all of these entities will be taking uh, something to their boards to uh, add SMART as the seventh partner to help implement the Resilient 37 program. And that concludes my presentation. Pilgrim, that was a damn fine report. Thank you, James. A lot of information there. Steve. <clears throat> yeah, uh, thank you. This The uh, information about the tolling is interesting. Um, does this mean that there will not be a bill next year uh, uh, to authorize tolling on the bridge? To my knowledge, there's no plan for uh, the, you know, the legislation to move forward. The plan is to look at that CTC existing authority. Okay, thanks. Harris. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I, I find this, uh, really interesting and then looking at multiple phases um in general i tend to be uh wary of highway widening because you know we widen roads and then just more people ride on them but i am happy to see the um a toll um to see how that balances things out so i don't know i have really i have mixed feelings about about what the the end result will be of all that but um yeah maybe i don't know if you have any response uh to that about you know the how how much widening a, a road increases traffic and how much does having a toll you know it really make people carpool i don't know yeah no i mean this this project is 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 nothing of a typical uh well so what so it's unique in so many ways right and i just compacting what i compacted down was was as as brief as i could get to get provide you the context of what's happening you really have um, a a near-term and long-term approach that complement each other the, the near-term project that would implement the toll um, not only reduces GHG and reduces VMT based on the current modeling, um, it will generate funding to advance that ultimate solution that we all want, right? And we wanna see that causeway, we wanna see the, the Balins connected underneath, removing that impediment um, that, that's, that's been there uh, since the late 18, 1800s. And to, to get there without the early implementation phase, you're you're not allowing for the um, you're, you're not you're you're if you to get there without the early implementation phase, you don't have that seed money that you need to try to compete for um, you know construction funding, and that's what um, grantees, whether it's the latest bill, uh, you know the bipartisan infrastructure law. They want to fund construction, right? They don't want to fund studies and environments. So um, it's not your typical highway widening. It's nothing like what we've done out here on Highway 101 with just a carpool lane. When you add that toll, it is a VMT reducing function. In some cases, I might even say more so than the funding because to come up with the mitigations 
if you don't use pricing, you might double the cost of the project. Um, they're experiencing that uh, in, in other locations within District 4 now where they haven't even released the 680 Express Lanes environmental document yet, looking at what it's going to take to mitigate for an express lane. Because even just an express lane that doesn't have a full toll component, it's just you pay in a smaller incremental amount, that still doesn't reduce VMT. To do it, you have to have a large enough dollar amount that's equal to um, the, you know, what you're paying on those toll bridges across the bay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, I'd also add one thing, James, and that is with, with the queuing that's taking place on 37 today and in the near future, we don't have all the information on people delivering goods via a different route to avoid that queuing. So we don't really know how much VMTs are going to be lowered should this get widened. Eris, this is a direct response to your question. Sometimes widening is better because it reduces the other VMTs that are going via alternate routes. I, I know for a fact that when I drive that route, I'm looking uh, to avoid that uh, direct route and I'm driving a lot more miles to get around it, even if it takes me about the same amount of time, environmentally, that's not the right thing to do. So, you know, I applaud that they're moving forward with this uh, two-pronged approach or three-pronged approach, if you will. I think it's much needed and it's complicated as hell. Uh, Tom <laughs> Conlon. Yeah, thanks for the overview, James, because I haven't been able to follow this as closely as I would have liked. Um, so I recall several months ago, Jared Huffman had raised some concerns that it didn't really make sense to invest in a roadway that was going to be underwater in a sh relatively short period of time. And I, I think you indicated in your converse, in your, in your presentation that there is an opportunity perhaps to pivot to sea level rise 2130 as a, a new design, uh, objective. Um, but one of the things that occurs to me as you're talking is that to the points that have been made before here, we, we're, we're assuming there's going to be VMT reductions based on the pricing, the means-based tolling. But we don't necessarily know how that's going to actually materialize. So do, are there other actual projects being implemented elsewhere in the state, in the Bay Area, um, where we might see that in advance of having to invest in this fairly expensive uh, project. Uh, I, I just, I feel like basing the BMT reductions on modeling at this stage is kind of a nervous, makes me nervous to do that. So they, I mean, I, I'm very familiar with them with our, I mean, the modeling itself is being done by, you know, MTC. Um, they will be presenting to our board in December. As far as specific projects that, you know, they, they've shown this, I don't have examples right offhand. I can follow up with the folks that did the modeling at MTC. Um, and it is, they do, they do use the, you know, the, the nine Bay Area countywide model, right? So, um, they're, they're looking at how this affects all of those alternative routes, right? Whether folks are, that were using Richmond Center Fell would move to, move to Highway 37 or, or up to 121, 29. So it is, it is a very holistic model, and it's, it's the best science that we have available right now. Um, so as far as specific examples, I can look into that and get back to you. Yeah, the simple question is just we're expanding roadway capacity and we're adding pricing. And I think I understand that the modeling is not, what, what I saw in the modeling was that they were projecting as the baseline that the same amount, amount of traffic would still need to go over Highway 37 that does now, plus a escalation factor, assuming growth and population and, and jobs and economy. And so that, resulted in a ridiculous baseline of like a six hour wait to get across the bridge. 
and or the, the cause with the, the, the uh, existing roadway. And so if you're assuming that all those cars are going to still show up, then you can show data, you can show VAT reduction based on that, I think, artificially elevated baseline. Because if we didn't improve the roadway, we let it flood, and we did let, re rely on the other roadways around the area, you know, VMT would actually probably go down. And because it would be so inconvenient to drive a single person vehicle. So the idea that pricing is going to get in there, I think, is clever. But I just don't have a lot of confidence in that uh, that story yet. Yeah, it's it sounds like you. I mean, I, I'm I'm not of the expertise to answer this question. Uh, but just a there is a uh, Nine Bay Area County Next Generation Freeway study that MTC is implementing right now. That's looking at uh, pricing as a DMT reduction measure, right, to be able to meet the goals of Plan Bay Area 2050. Uh, as it as it moves forward, so there, I'm hearing kind of two things. I'm hearing one, like wanting to hear a, a better explanation of how pricing truly addresses VNT, um, and then and then two is there is there any uh, not just modeling but uh, you know real data that's been gathered on this topic. Uh, right. If and, if we could know, that that yeah. If we if we could implement the pricing on an existing stretch of roadway without having to build extra lane capacity to then test the pricing model. That's kind of where I'm saying is that might build everybody's confidence around this if there was more, uh, more of an example someplace else in the Bay Area. I realize we may be the most, the, the guinea pig for the rest of the Bay Area right now on this, but just, just food for thought. I don't have anything else really to add. Yeah, let me let me let me just add a little bit to that. So on the next generation pricing, right, where you're looking at adding next generation freeways, where you're looking at adding pricing to existing freeways, you're really looking to do that on freeways that have high quality transit, right? So you want that BART lane, BART, you want uh, Caltrain, you want something that gives folks that high quality transit alternative to, you know, jumping in their car and driving on the freeway. So as that study rolls out, those are the locations where it's gonna roll out. On 37, the project team that's been working on advancing that under the guidance of the four county policy committee, we've always had the thought process of, we're not gonna implement a toll unless the public is given something, right? They're, they're, it's not gonna be start tolling the, you know, this road where these folks have to live in Solano County to be able to get to jobs in Marin. It's always been, we need to build something to justify adding that toll because you don't have the high quality transit. You're going to have fledging transit that will start on the corridor. Thanks for that, James. Appreciate the back and forth. James, I don't want to bring up a, another half hour subject, but if you could address the, the one, and I know you had to pare this down for the information purposes, but equity uh, part of this uh, pricing was just one of your bullet points in there. Can you give me the, the two minute version on what's being talked about equity wise and who's gonna make that final determination as to what that's gonna look like? Yeah, happy to do that. So uh, within, within the SB 1050 legislation, there was some, some details that were there. That those, those details are, um, you know, uh, definitely a um, outline for what's uh, going to be proposed and move forward. Um, the ultimate uh, decision on that is going to be made by the California Transportation Commission um, as the tolling proposal moves forward through their uh, existing authority that they have to be able to implement a toll on new lanes that are built. Uh, the short answer to your question is, there's been some pilot studies that MTC has looked at on express lanes. We're looking to mirror those pilot studies, which essentially says that if your um, if your income is less than two times over the federal poverty rate, there would be a significant discount on the toll that you would have to pay. Um, so that's that's kind of the the high level summary with with final confirmation through a CTC or California Transportation Commission process. Thank you for that. 
Great job. A lot of information in there. Any other uh, questions or comments? I believe we're on to announcements. Thanks, James. Chris, yeah, I, yeah, I have a quick an announcement. We have a couple job openings at SETA right now, one for a data analyst uh, to help out with the travel model and all of our data needs and also a transportation planner working on transit integration. So if you know anyone that may be interested, please pass that along. So those are both on the SGTA website. Thank you. I'll put a quick plug in for the ECA. We have a, a, our annual general membership meeting on November 15th from four to 5.30 at the Bennett Valley uh, facility out there. And we have uh, planes, trains, and automobiles will be our subject matter. We've got uh, John Stout, Eddie Cummins, and David Rabbit addressing their respective uh, areas of expertise out there. So you never know, we might get a kernel of wisdom that we don't already know from something like that. So if anybody's interested in that, please let me know. Tickets are available and uh, we do very little ECA business at that. It'll mostly be the presentation, planes, trains, and automobiles. Uh, secondly, I also wanted to just give a shout out to uh, Senator McGuire and his great Redwood uh, railway path that, that uh, I, I sat in at that town hall meeting. Incredible amount of work and an incredible vision. Whether you agree with the final price or not, we won't even know what the final price is for a year or two, probably. But uh, they have come a long way in a very short period of time. And it could be a monumental change for uh, the North Coast uh, region up there uh, from an economic standpoint. Those are my two announcements, Chris, Ross, Drew. I got one more. Just one yeah, more you to go, announce. boy. You go. You That's go. it. Um, there is no SCTA RCPA board meeting in November. We will meet, the board will meet again in December. Just want to, that's why the agenda is not on the. Um, so so the right board now. doesn't meet, but we do in but November. We will. Okay, yes. thank you. Yes. The board will not meet in November, but the CAC will. We're working harder than the board. That's what it amounts to. I appreciate it. And I appreciate all of you guys. Hey, Kurt, um, I really am going to miss you, my friend. Mark, thank you for taking his seat. But uh, hats off to you, Kurt Nichols. And if it, uh, if it doesn't ring the chime of the grandchildren and travel, <laughs> I can understand why you're not interested these days. Yeah, well, we, we all only have so much time and it's time for me to yeah. shift to uh, some other priorities. So uh, enjoyed my time here and I'll miss y'all too. Enjoy it, my friend. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. With that, we're adjourned. Great meeting, guys. Thank you all. Happy Halloween, everybody. <laughs> Bye, Shauna. Thank you for ending with that. <laughs>